And let me share with you some of our LAI key achievements. And uh, LAI was founded in 2012. Its member, both national and international, are eminent doctors in the field of medicine and preventive cardiology who have special interest in the field of lipids. The aim of LAI is to promote research in the field of lipids and spread awareness about association of dyslipidemia and ASCVD, and also to promote evidence-based treatment of lipid disorder. Since its inception, it has held a number of national and international conferences. This, this is our first original publication uh, by LAI. After it, it was funded by Lipid Association of India. This is regarding prevalence and pattern of dyslipidemia in 2,500 school-going children in the age group of uh, 14 to uh, 19 years in sub-urban area of India. Overall, we have uh, uh, you know, published three consensus statements. And the uh, first consensus statement was published in 2016 in JAPI. And the aim of this uh, consensus statement was to educate clinicians in the lipid management in their routine clinical uh, practice. The highlight of th this consensus statement was, uh, uh, was the proposed ASCVD risk stratification algorithm for Indian patients, in which we stratified patients into the four groups uh, based upon their ASCVD risk and their respective LDL cholesterol target. It's a very simple risk algorithm doesn't require any computer or internet. If you have this uh, chart with you, you will be able to classify your patient into uh, the group in which it, he falls. And another important uh, uh, you know, message which we wanted to convey is uh, uh, regarding the lifetime risk assessment of uh, those patients or those population who, have, who fall into low risk group. Low risk group, uh, if they have more than 30% uh, lifetime risk, uh, then they are reclassified as moderate uh, risk group and treated accordingly. We were the first association in the world to uh, recommend LDL cholesterol less than 50 milligram in patients with established ASCVD and uh, other high risk group patients. Uh, we had a lot of uh, problem in convincing our professional colleagues that, that this is the real target for Indian population. But it, many of them agreed and some of them didn't. But uh, thanks to the European guidelines in 2019, uh, they literally endorsed what we said in 2016. <coughs> this is consensus part two, uh, which was published in European Journal of Clinical Lipidology in 2017. It focused on management of dyslipidemia in specific patient population like CKD, heart failure, uh, familial hypoplasmolem, and others. Uh, the existing K-DEGO guidelines of dyslipidemia and CKD have been modified by us, keeping in mind the risk profile of Indian population. We'll be, we'll be having another series of CMEs uh, tentatively from 15th August on dyslipidemia in specific patient population, statin intolerance and lifestyle therapeutic for Indian populations. This is our... Uh, uh, third consensus, uh, you know, paper which was published in Journal of Clinical Lipidology, uh, in which we have added one uh, uh, additional ASCVD risk group, which we call as extreme risk group, and uh, with the targets. I think it will be discussed during uh, the presentation of LDL cholesterol. These are our upcoming uh, publications. Uh, ex expert consensus statement part three will be published uh, somewhere in uh, October 2020. And uh, we are uh, on the way to uh, launch our first book of uh, textbook of clinical lipidology, possibly by February 2021. And, and we are planning to start Lipid Association Journal of Lipidology shortly. Uh, LAI started uh, registry of, of LAI started FH registry uh, last year, and uh, since then we have uh, registered about 55 patients of homozygous FH, and I think. Uh, uh, I'll request you to enroll your patient of FH in this uh, national uh, LAI FH registry uh, by visiting our website lipid.net.in and in case you have any problem, you can always be in touch with our national coordinator, Dr. Iyengar. And if all of us join uh, together, uh, probably LAI FH registry will be one of the largest FH registry in the world. And uh, one thing more, I want to say that we provide free medicines, uh, means st uh, statin and uh, 
azetamide to the poor patients and also uh, if uh, your patient is poor and cannot afford genetic testing which you think is important we can uh, get it done free at the cost of uh, at the cost will be borne by lai Uh, India represented FH Global Call to Action on Familial Hypercholesterolemia, in which uh, nine recommendations were uh, uh, discussed to increase uh, awareness about uh, FH and its early diagnosis and its treatment. Uh, five out of these nine we are already, uh, you know, practicing, and other four are difficult for LAI to do it without the help of the government agencies. Uh, we have a lipidology certification course. So we have been doing it for the last five years now. A very difficult course. On only ten candidates have, uh, you know, uh, is, they are successful in getting this certification course, and this is endorsed both by IAS and uh, LAI. And uh, those who are interested can always uh, be in touch with the Torrent executives. We are not only in my interest interested in academic uh, activities, but uh, we also organize all india healthy heart medical cricket tournament uh, uh, for the doctors and uh, the purpose of this tournament is to increase awareness about uh, coronary artery disease and uh, risk of uh, uh, modifiable risk factors including lipid uh, dyslipidemia to uh, uh, to the doctors of all specialties because uh, when we discuss these webinar activities or cmvs we are only physicians who are involved but i think uh, this awareness should go to the other specialties also so this is in in short the key achievements of lai and uh, i'm extremely thankful to uh, torrent pharma for being an academic partner of lai for this uh, program thank you thank you very much thank you very much sir for all insight about the lai in a short time in a very small amount of a time and uh, congratulations for all your achievement of lipid association of india with that i would like to take the opportunity to introduce the both uh, chairperson of the the day i would like to take the opportunity to invite the chairperson who will lead the session so first chairperson of the day is dr satyanarayan rautrai who is a senior cardiologist professor and head of the cardiology scb medical college and hospital katak he has trained cardiologist from the university of rhone in france germany and aims delhi he has got many fellowship which some of them are acc esc scai csi and icc dr raut rai is examiner of bm and dnb cardiology he has got more than 60 publication in index medical journal and contributed chapter in textbook cardiology and api update second chair person we are having dr jayant kumar panda who is a senior consultant physician and diabetologist professor of department of medicine scb medical college and hospital katak has got a fellowship of icp acp im ams rssgi and diabetes india he is a governing body member of api and a member of advisory council of governor acp india uh, dr panda has got 71 national and international publication and he is a principal investigator of international and national trial with this i would like to invite dr satyanarayan raut rai to introduce the moderator of the day dr raut rai please sir please unmute sir raut rai sir please unmute yourself okay yes sir thanks thanks thank you vatnagar today today we have three topics three moderators and three speakers and moderators are Dr. Vishwaranjan Mishra, who is a senior cardiologist and consultant in Max Diagnostic at Kota, he has um, fellowship in CS, CSI, Indian Academy of Echocardiography, ICC, and ESC. Currently, secretary of Cardiological Society of India, Odisha chapter. He is the current reviewer of Indian Heart Journal and contributed to cardiology update since uh, 2011. The next moderator. Dr. Robin Aran Kaur, who is senior diabetologist, having practice of more than 30 years, multiple publications in national and international journals, he is invited faculty in many national and international seminars. We will not find anywhere any national or inter international conference. Dr. Kaur must be there. And Dr. Gopinath Parida in the third session, he is DM cardiology with fellow 
ESC has multiple publications in national and international journals. He is an invited faculty in various national and international forums. Uh, without uh, any delay, I will hand over the mic to Dr. Jayant Kumar Pandey to introduce our speakers. Respect to Raman Puri, Dr. S. S. Ayengar, and Dr. S. N. Narasingam, Prof. Rautra, and my senior uh, faculties and the colleagues as moderators. My job is to introduce speakers, and you know all the speakers are very eloquent and uh, masters of their field, and they'll uh, speak on the very interesting topics uh, like real cholesterol. Like diabetes, dyslipidemia, uh, family hyperlipidemia, very relevant in our practice. To introduce uh, Dr. Nirmal Kumar Mohan, senior faculty in the Department of Cardiology at SV Medical College, and is a uh, DM Cardiology and fellow of European Society of Cardiology, Indian College of Cardiology, and many associations. Multiple publications, national and international, as well as uh, faculty in many conferences we have heard him. Then uh, Dr. Jayashree Shwani, uh, who is uh, a good friend of mine and uh, DM Endocrinology and from IMS uh, BHU Varanarash and Distinction uh, FIDM Law, a life member of all the uh, diabetic, endocrine and the medical associations around and he sees many publications as well as uh, a faculty in national and international events will be speaking to you about diabetic dyslipidemia. Uh, Dr. Chabi Shakpati, a senior uh, faculty in the Department of Cardiology, uh, CHPM, uh, Cardiology and Flow of all cardiological uh, societies around internationally. And she has received Women Achiever Award from uh, Chief Minister uh, Mr. Ramin Patnaik in 2005. Then Rajya Puraskar Awardee from Governor uh, um, Shri Madari in 2011, and also a prize winner in the first prize winner in the uh, free paper in the ICS conference. Uh, everybody have heard her uh, multiple uh, in multiple forums uh, as a faculty, and also she has published in national and international journals. We have a very light panel today. Uh, let us listen to them. Now I request uh, Dr. Vishwaranjan Misra to start the proceedings of the first session. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, now for the first session, uh, we have uh, Dr. Nirmal Chandra Mahanti. As you know, the LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, is the principal culprit in causing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, raised levels of LDL has been associated with increased morbidity and mortality. At the same time, uh, lowering of LDL cholesterol is associated with improvement in cardiovascular outcome. Therefore, what level to decrease and by what means to achieve the desired levels will be dealt with Dr. Nirmal Chandra Mahanti. With these words, I invite Dr. Mahanti. So please speak on the topic. Dr. Mahanti, please. Thank you, Mr. Hello, good evening, all. Today, sir. My topic today is on LDL cholesterol, low density lipo lipoprotein cholesterol, that is the culprit and the target in achieving our de desired targets and better outcome in patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. LDL cholesterol causes Atherosclerotic disease, which is evidenced by Nirmal, sir, your presentation is not coming. Please share your slides. Slides are not coming. Nirmal, please share the slides. Yes, sir. Yeah. Go to the first. First and PPT form. Full screen. Hello. Full screen, sir. 
go down this cup cup shape yeah yeah near to this cup cup shape just click it hello yeah yes sir it started did you go yes okay. yes we can see sir please go ahead LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease which is evidenced by epidemiology studies randomized controlled clinical trials various animal studies and more so from the familial hypercholesterolemia then mean LDL value in meta analysis of four trials comparing high dose statin versus moderate dose statin therapy four trials prove it A to Z, T N D and I D L. The previous two one, first two, dealing with the patients with acute coronary syndrome, and the latter two in patients with stable coronary disease, involving a total of twenty seven thousand five hundred forty patients, in which the prior statin use was in only twenty eight point two percent. Based upon this meta analysis, the adult treatment panel three opted in two thousand four recommended L D L C to less than or deciliter in patients with coronary heart disease or chd equivalent as it is shown in the graph the a standardized a standardized death rate at cpd over a period of one decade that is from 2000 to 2010 it is shows there is a gradual decrease in death for one lakh western population whereas there is increasing cvd mortality in india as it is seen in men uh, and as well may women the cvd mortality is 31% versus 13% in females the isd 39% versus 26% but there is a decline in cerebral stroke in male versus females why the higher propensity of cad among indians other traditional risk factors central abdominal adiposity and risk factor at a younger age in addition to that there is low control rates of hypertension cholesterol diabetes and smoking and use of tobacco the normal the atherogenic dyslipidemia is characterized by normal or mildly raised low density lipoprotein cholesterol high dg non hdlc and remnant cholesterol low hdlc prevalence of increased lipoprotein a and high prevalence of small ldl particle we are following the american Since 1988, but the CBD mortality increased in India by 42 percent since 1998, whereas it has declined by more than 50 percent in Western and European countries. Approximately 40 percent of Indians with CBD are less than 40 years of age, and 25 percent of those that are dying of CBD 40 years of age. We developed CBD 10 years earlier than the other ethnic group. we suffer the most severe form of coronary disease and we succumb because of the higher mortality so scg has considered scn ethnicity as a high risk ethnic group in addition to this poor awareness about cbd and the primordial prevention dietary patterns and factors and there is no treatment guidelines for this disease till december 2014 hence Need our own recommendations. Lipid Association of India expert consensus recommendations part one and two after a uniform brainstorming sessions all over India in different sessions established the guideline which is published in 2016. The recommendations are how to approach atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. That is. The recommendations in Indians that is published in 2016 that is a major atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk factors. 
aged being more than 45 in males and more than 55 years in females. Family is still premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, current cigarette smoking, high blood pressure and low HDLC. Other high risk features, diabetes with no or one other major risk factors and no evidence of target or organ damage. Security stage 3 B or 4, familial hypercholesterolemia other than familial homozygous hypercholesterolemia. Screen of a single risk factor like LDL being blood pressure more than 180 by 110 and coronary calcium score being more than 300 non lipoprotein A more than 50 mg per deciliter moderate risk non conventional risk factor like coronary calcium score 100 to 299 increased carotid intima media thickness lipoprotein A 20 to 49 mg per deciliter and metabolic syndrome to low, moderate, high, and very high risk, that is low risk, one major atherosclerotic risk factor, lifetime CPD risk being less than 30%. Other, that is moderate risk factor, two major risk factors, risk group with more than one moderate risk, non conventional risk factor, lifetime CPD risk being more than 30%. High risk, more than major atherosclerotic risk factors or two major risk factors with one or more than one moderate is non of more than one other high risk features. Very high risk, pre existing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, diabetes with more than equal to two other major risk factors or evidence of target organ damage, familial homozygous hypercholesterolemia. No class recommendation, no level of evidence, but the risk calculation is recommended as per joint British society risk calculation. Treatment goals and statin, treatment goals and statin initiation threshold according to the categories that is by Lipid Association of India. Risk category that is very high risk. The treatment goal is to achieve a 50 non HST mode less than 80. And drug therapy, preferably in all the patients having more than 50 LDLC, more than 80 milligram per deciliter of non HDLC. Very high risk, you know, high risk, less than 70 LDLC, less than 100 non HDLC. And treatment in all the patients having more than 70 of LDLC and more than 100 of non HDLC. Moderate risk, goal is LDLC less than 100 and non HDLC less than 130. And treatment in patients having more than 100 equal to 100 LDLC and HDLC non HDLC more than equal to 130. But a low risk group, the objective of the goal is same, less than 100, less than 130. But treatment should start when HDLC. Or LDLC is more than 130 or non HLC is more than 160, subject to initial adequate non pharmacological intervention for at least three months. So the target LDLC less than 50 is the objective and residual CV risk. Residual CV risk remains even after intensive starting therapy that is shown when the mean. LDLC is achieved either 95 to 62 in group 52 trial, from 104 to 81 in ideal trial, or TNT trial when the label is reached from 77 from 101. Still, there is my CBD incidence is quite so very low levels of atherogenic lipoproteins and the risk of cardiovascular defect. Meta analysis of eight tracking trials show. Lower the factor, that is LDLC being less than 50, the was 0.44 versus if it is more than 75 to less than 100 in 0.56. Statin mediated protein LDL lowering is associated with greater plaque stabilization and regression. So less than 50, the plaque bottom mean atheroma volume percentage of mean atheroma volume is also less. Another trial which improved, which showed 
नॉन फटल एम आर एम का सीधी डेथ और नॉन फटल स्ट्रोक वाज लेस वेयर द मीन एलडीएलसी वाज एक्चुअली कट वाले ऑफ बीइंग 53 वर्सेस 70 इन पेशेंट्स हु आर गिवन मोनोथेरेपी विद स्टार्टिंग दैट इज सिम्बास्टेटिन और ए कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ सिम्बास्टिन वर्सेस एजिटिमाइल सो मीन एलडीएलसी द लेस द मीन एलडीएलसी बेटर द आउटकम then risk reduction depends if it is 50 to 60 reduction there is a 50 percent reduced reduction with the mortality it is in 2015 the study that is placebo versus alirocumab in otc long term study or standard of care versus ifolocumab in oslo one and two studies the reduction of risk was around half in patients achieving 50 mg dl of ldnc the mean value of ldnc being 50 mg per dl otc outcome trial alirocumab in patients after scs that is the post scs patients recruited I think he is disconnected. So, please request him to reconnect. Yeah. Yeah. Rajiv, near. Calling, calling him, calling him. Yeah. Ready? Is there anybody to assist him? Ah, yes, yes. Vivek is there. Okay. He is connecting. I called him and he just reconnected. Ah, Ashis. Ashis, why don't you share from your end? Ah, uh, uh, connect. Okay, okay. Rajiv. Rajiv, Mr. Nair. Yeah. Doctor, doctor, doctor Nirmal. Without his picture, that will give a better. Uh, Sir, you please yes. unmute and uh, yes, please unmute yourself. Rajiv, uh, you share uh, Dr. Nirmal's slides. Yeah, we can share that. We can share, sir. Uh, Nirmal, sir, please, please unmute. unmute yourself. The audio is also not clear. Dr. Nirmal, please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Rajiv, who is with uh, Dr. Nirmal? We make our uh, colleague is there. Who is there? Vivo. We make. We make. You can you tell tell him to uh, off the video? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just okay. guide him to uh, off the video. Yes. If connectivity is less, making off the video will help. Uh, now yes. he has made it off. Yes. Now please continue. Yeah. The audio will improve. Audio. Yeah. Yeah. We 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 have asked him to off the video. As I already told you. Yeah, Doctor Kumar, you can start now.
डॉक्टर कुमार हेलो हेलो यार कैन यू कैन यू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट इज द इशू या ये ऑडिबल प्लीज गो एड सर ओके जी आप सर सर निर्मल सर यू आर रिक्वेस्टेड टू स्पीक लाउडली सर आप प्लीज स्पीक लाउडली सर ऑडिबल यस 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 ओडेसी आउटकम ट्रायल दैट इज अलिरोपिवा विल पेशेंट सप्रेसियस हेलो आई एम ऑडिबल यस सर यस सर दिस इंक्लूडेड पेशेंट्स ऑफ पोस्ट एसीएस पेशेंट्स one to 12 months prior to this in in that 60 on a high intensity or maximum tolerated dose of atrovastatin or rosuvastatin at least one lipid entry criterion was made it was more than 70 mg per deciliter or non hdl was more than 100 mg per deciliter with treatment of subcutaneous alirocumab maybe 2 weeks or placebo the objective was to achieve the target range being ldl which is being 45 to 50 mg if it is of 250 under the acceptable beyond it was not desirable so at four weeks basal ldlc was 99 achieved was 37.3 at 48 weeks the ldlc achieved was 53.3 mg per deciliter with a 15% reduction in primary endpoints so the otc outcome trial published in 2018 after the lipid association india recommendation of 60 also endorsed lowering ldlc around 50 mg per deciliter results in mass reduction likely european guidelines in 2019 the cardiovascular risk categories the treatment goals that was also targeting to have 50 mg deciliter very high risk and that was again proposed as proposed in 2016 that is goal of ldl to be less than 50 mg per deciliter but the significant residual risk with very low achieved ldlc by improve its study that aggressive ldlc lowering does not eliminated all cardiovascular disease as seen in patient achieving ldlc 70 versus that of 53 over a long period of follow up around 6 years in improved study the cd events were 34.7% versus 32.7% so there was significant residual risk still with achievement of ldl goal 50 mg per deciliter so we have to rehabilitating ldlc targets the lower the ldlc achieved the greater the reduction in clinical endpoints so the clinicians need to start rehabilitating ldlc targets with the known cardiovascular disease atherosclerotic disease and other risk factors so there is need to reduce ldlc level to level less than 30 mg per deciliter via the data so there is a cv benefit at these levels so cv benefit will be increase proportionally to the reduction in ldlc so lii conducted series of 19 meetings in 13 cities involving 160 experts over 11 months and published the expert consent statement in this year that in the month of march which is published in the again journal of clinical epidemiology but the objective is clinical approach that is by the major risk factors or the high risk factors are same whereas moderate means non conventional risk factors in addition to the previous four there is additional two factors like apolipoprotein b more than 110 or equal to that and hsr high sensitivity are being less more than 2 mg per liter Risk then risk categorization low risk moderate risk high risk and very high risk same but there is a extreme risk which is categorized to category A and B that is established coronary disease with 
more than one teacher of high risk group or category B there is CNU with more than equal to one teacher of very high risk group or recurrent SES within one year despite LDLC achieved being achieved that is less than 50 milligram per deciliter or there is presence of polyvascular disease. So newer treatment goals and starting initiation threshold based on the risk categories proposed by liquidation recommendation is the extreme risk group category A. The optimal goal is less than desired goal is less than 50 LDLC, non is less than 80, optional being less than 30 and less than 60 respectively. Recommended drug therapy LDLC more than 80, non HDLC. Then nothing is audible. I think we are disconnected again. Is it audible? Rajiv? No, no, no sir. Not, not audible. Uh, just talk, Rajiv. Mm -hmm. I think this is a last, last mm -hmm. slide only. Lights are also not moving. Okay. I think you can share from your end. Problem, problem is not yeah. sharing. Problem is this internet connection. We can share. Disconnect. Pull here. I think. Ah, next connection. Yeah. Problem. Or I have to open it. So I think that the time time is already completed for the first talk. Uh, Rajiv. Uh, Rajiv. Another three, four minutes yes, and we will go to the next speaker. Yeah, we will yes, we'll, we'll wait for a minute because he is almost on the conclusion, on the words of conclusion. Yes. So if, if he is not guiding... What is the status, Rajiv? Connectivity issue. Yeah, the Connected? Yes, yes. yes. Hello. Yeah. Yes, please, please. Yeah, Nirmal, sir. Requested to conclude, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Rajiv. Optimal control of diabetes and hypertension and reinforcement of lifestyle measures with high intensity statin therapy. Then, if it is very high risk, LTAC level more than 50 or diacetamide, LTAC level being 50, consider PCS can inhibitors. The goal of LTAC is less than 50 mg per deciliter. But in extreme high risk group, that is extreme group, LTLC is more than diacetamide and LTLC level more than 50 still, category A, the goal is to have less than 50 or optional being less than 30 and PCS can category B consider PCS can inhibitor goal LLC is always less than 30 So the justification of lipidation of India recommendation that target LLC less than 30 mg per deciliter. It is again by the four year plan, the vessel LDLC being 93, median LDLC achieved 30 mg. There was CD, death, MI, stroke, hospitalization, or coronary or coronary not less in Ebola group as compared to the plasma. So, efficacy of intensive lowering of LDLC subjects with low baseline LDLC as 
done by cholesterol treatment dialysis collaboration of this lancet it could it showed meta analysis of randomized control trials of more than 1000 participants and more than 2 years treatment duration of more versus less intense treatment trials involving more than 1.5 lakh subjects it showed even when baseline ldl was less than 70 mg per cent 1 millimole that is 39 mg of in ldl 230 mg of ldl showed mass reduction of 37% the relative risk reduction was 0.63 improved trial the mass reduced significantly the ldl less than 30 versus more than 70 the hazard ratio 0.0 So the picture, if it is less than real, the mass rate was six percent versus thirty-six percent when it was between fifty to seventy. The volume and regression of atheroma at different levels of LDL in Glasgow trial, the percent atheroma volume was less when there was a optimal goal of LDL to achieve versus when it was not achieved. That was zero point five percent increase in the atheroma volume. Fraction uh, showing regression. Doctor Nirmal, the time. Doctor Nirmal, time is out. Please conclude, sir. Conclude. BCS K. So to conclude, the part of the LDLs. The poor, poor quality of voice is not. Indians are in class. However, the final decision should follow a detailed discussion and treating physician. That is sad decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Dr. Panda, please. Jayanta sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohanty. Uh, that was a very nice topic, the LDL cholesterol and uh, our approach to that. There are some technical snags I understand, but uh, you can cover up uh, the rest in the. Panel discussion and also in question answer we have a one hour long question answer at the end and immediately we'll go to the next topic which is very uh, vital the diabetic dyslipidemia and uh, Professor Jayesh Swami will be taking over this topic diabetic dyslipidemia this session will be moderated by uh, Ravi Shah uh, and I request uh, Dr. Ravi Narayan Kar uh, to uh, start uh, the session and introduce the speaker Dr. Kar. Dr. Kar, please unmute. Please unmute, sir. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening to all of you. It is a very great privilege to share this virtual platform with the luminaries from the field of cardiodiabetic and lipidology. It is a well known that substantial number of diabetic two patients succumb to cardiovascular events despite having very good SB1C, normal BP. near normal ldc though dyslipidemia is a common risk factor in all the atherosclerotic vascular diseases there is a difference in t2 dm diabetic dyslipidemia otherwise called atherogenic dyslipidemia is a different entity it is a mixed dyslipidemia with a complex etiopathology with a composition and functional changes which makes vascular milieu much more pro inflammatory and pro thrombotic leading to premature atherosclerotic disease and microvascular complication culminating in 3 pc mesh so to address all this issue of atherogenic dyslipidemia in diabetics and its management i invite mrs dr mrs swain dr swain please Uh, 
जैसे मैं मारू देव या हां यस यस हेलो राजीव हां यस प्लीज मैडम प्लीज शेयर मैडम हां या गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी एंड इट्स माई प्राउड प्रिविलेज टू बी हियर विथ ऑल ऑफ यू सो सो मेनी लर्न एंड पर्सन इज दर्डियोलॉजिस्ट एचओडी कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट दे आर एंड सो मेनी अदर कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट एंड देर एंड डायबेटोलॉजिस डायबेटिस from the national diabetes and diabetic retinopathy survey report of 2019 the prevalence of the diabetes is 18.8 percent in the people above age 50 years and if you look to the लीडिंग and it is a leading cause of the end stage renal disease 42% of these peoples they have the blindness uh, they have the diabetes uh, end stage renal disease they have the diabetes and it is 50% of the all non traumatic amputation is due to the diabetes and if you look to the mortality of for diabetes that is excuse me jayashree uh, madam yeah can you off your video audio quality is not good so if you can off your video quality will be better of your video only video are ki radio should i do from here madam should we do from here jayashree madam जय श्री जी इज इट ऑडिबल प्लीज मेक ऑफ योर वीडियो ऑल ऑफ अस शुड मेक वीडियो ऑफ सो दैट द ऑडियो क्वालिटी विल इंप्रूव यस यस ऑल ऑफ अस विल मेक इट ऑफ मे बी द इंटरनेट बैंड एक्चुअली द वॉइस इज नॉट गोइंग टू हर आई थिंक इज डिस्कनेक्टेड राजीव सर Uh, i think uh, you should talk on a phone and uh, we can share the presentation from our side yeah that will be better the presentation will be less let's try let's try once uh oh yeah yeah as you improve the internet bandwidth uh, the voice and uh, uh, the video all are being distorted and all the slide presentations are getting interrupted within yeah yeah but this problem we are finding only in odisha because daily we don't find such type problem because this program we are connecting madam gote kaam karu connect kar de ek ko ame slide share kar do ate madam ko pakhar ke achanti ate gote phone kari ko so kotha ho leni madam ko sange madam connect kar chuti madam video off kar de slide to share kar de sir ate to slides All the slides you share from the. Can you please share the slides? Ah ha ha. Slide number two. Slide number two. Just a minute. Uh, near. 
please unmute yourself yes sir uh, you you got connected with madam uh, yes yes already discussed so, with she is me. joining yes ab unko yahi bolo ki video off rakhenge bol diya bol diya sir presenting from here bol diya sir theek perfect Hello. Ah, madam. Uh, now I- I'll continue from the. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you slide, just slide, just turn yeah, the please. next slide. Rajiv will change. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, coming to the digit digit burden of the diabetes, I have already discussed. Next slide, please. Uh, that is a duration cardiovascular disease with the duration of the diabetes. That is a good correlations between that uh, between these two things. If the duration of the diabetes is less than two years, then there is fifteen uh, percent uh, risk of the cardiovascular disease. And when the duration of the diabetes is increased to the ten to fifteen years, it is around thirty percent. And when it is fifteen years, it is extended to fifteen the tune of the fifty percent. So again, uh, there is duration of the diabetes and CB mortality. Next slide, please, Rajiv. If there is um, next next one, please. Duration of the diabetes is well correlated correlated with the CB mortality. When the duration of the diabetes is less than five years, and it is it is one risk relative risk is one point five percent. When the risk when the duration of the diabetes is increased increased to twenty five years, the it is uh, the risk is uh, increased to the three fold. Next one. So that is a well correlation of diabetes duration duration of the diabetes with the cardiovascular disease and that that also cardiovascular mortality. And as sir uh, next one, as sir have nicely described that uh, di- uh, dyslipidemia. Uh, next one please. Uh, that uh, in cardiovascular disease, the dyslipidemia. This dyslipidemia is next one please. Dyslipidemia is the major important factors. Next slide please, Mr. Rajiv. Next slide. Dyslipidemia is this major? Am I audible? Ha. Dyslipidemia yeah, yeah, is this major uh, event in the um, in the diabetic. So out of four, they, uh, nine out of ten diabetic patients, they are dyslipidemic in Indian scenario, and um, women are ma- ma- mainly sufferer of the in this diabetic dyslipidemia. And according to this 2000 2010 data publications, it's the Uh, there is 55 millions of these people. They are they are having this diabetic dyslipidemia. It is it is in 2010. If you look to this present scenario, it is coming around 10 millions uh, extra 10 millions of people are added to this scenario. So diabetic dyslipidemia are more are quite prevalent. And next coming to this uh, diabetic dyslipidemia. What is diabetic dyslipidemia? That is it is it is a cluster of uh, lipid abnormalities which includes This increased triglyceride level, increase uh, decrease LDL-C cholesterol level, and increase small dense LDL uh, particles. So this this is the pictorial representations of for uh, this uh, diabetic dyslipidemia, which uh, this, uh, which include this insulin resistance here, and along with that, along with that, increased triglyceride, in uh, decrease HDL-C, and uh, that uh, increase small dense LDL-C. There is increase in this uh, BLDL and APOB is there. and this is the beautiful pictorial representations of for diabetic dyslipidemia next one please again when the uh, insulin resistant diabetes insulin resistance hypertriglyceridemia all these things are correlated uh, beautifully next if the triglyceride level is very high that is in the tune of more than 250 in that scenario this is small dense ldl particle is more this this uh, uh, this is described beautifully in this slide that when the Triglyceride level is less than hundred. Eighty-five percent of the population they have these prominent large LDLs, 
and when this fasting triglyceride level is more than 250 85% of the population they have the prominent small ldl particle this is the scenario where the ldl where the uh, triglyceride level is high then ldl uh, small ldl cholesterol is more prevalent so coming to the next one as sir my co- my previous co speaker sir is nicely described the lowering of the next one please rajiv uh, the li- lowering the cholesterol ldlc cholesterol is more important so the next question is does lowering ldlc cholesterol reduces the event in this context i would like to describe two or three uh, two or three um, studies or slides in this scenario this is a beautiful study in which 2008 uh, 800 type 2 diabetes patients without coronary artery disease they are randomized to this atorvastatin 10 mg versus that of this placebo the baseline ldl cholesterol was uh, around 120 mg per deciliter and uh, that there is a four year follow up study is there at the end of this study there is event rate is more in placebo group as compared to this atorvastatin group and at the end of the study ldl cholesterol is 80 mg per deciliter so reduction of this ldl cholesterol the event rate is reduced which is evident from the study next slide please next coming to our, uh, another important study that is improve it study next slide please rajiv an uh, improve it study what i have previously described it is without coronary artery disease but improve it study is post acs patients and those patients who have this ldl cholesterol level is 50 to 125 mg per deciliter and in this study they are randomized to uh, simvastatins uh, and placebo to group uh, one group and simvastatin ezetimibe to another group and some of, uh, half of these patients they are diabetes and uh, another half of the patients they are uh, non diabetics in this study what happens the ldl after this treatment of the one years the ldl cholesterol level decreases to this 40 mg per the deciliters approximately same in both diabetic and non diabetic group and uh, that uh, my the event rate that means myocardial infarctions decreases to the 24 24% and ischemic stroke decreases in the tune of the j uh, 39% but all these cardiovascular events are not reduced in this study so sir has uh, that slide has been say, uh, described by uh, dr mahanti and uh, again coming to another important study that is four year study with evolucumab that is you know it is a, a um, uh, uh, that sir is nicely described that things uh, it is a blo- uh, the event re- event is uh, event re- event is cardiovascular death myocardial infarction and strokes and there is a uh, good amount of reductions of the ldl cholesterol um which is with evolucumab when compared with the placebo but at the end of this study if you look to the if you look to this uh, result there is 14% of the diabetic patient they had mes despite of they are achieving the ldl cholesterol of the 30 mg per deciliter so next one so despite of achieving this ldl cholesterol level 30 mg per the deciliter 14% of the diabetes patients they had this cv event thus we need to look into another lipoprotein in this view of high prevalence of atherogenic meaning dyslipidemia there so uh, now there may be this triglyceride may be this culprit a non hdl cholesterol may be this culprit or this level of uh, lipoproteins a if it is increased may be this culprit for this atherogenic dyslipidemia in this scenario so next one please so supporting of my is my statements there is a study known as the provoc ittm 22 study in this study this me uh mean achieved the ldl cholesterol level uh, with statin was 62 mg per the deciliter and those patients who have the triglyceride levels of more than 200 mg per the deciliter they have the event uh, residual uh, they have the event rate more and two years risk of death and myocardial uh, myocardial infarctions and recurrent acs is more in the triglyceride group uh when it is compared with the, that uh, those of the triglyceride level of less than 200 so apart from the ldl cholesterol triglyceride has important role so uh, coming to this next questions is high triglyceride level is a severe so supporting these things 
I think so I'll let, uh, discuss this slide is that the optimal serum level of the triglyceride in the lipid association of India, it is less than 100 milligram per the deciliters. And when it is more than 500, uh, it is very high. And the normal, it should be less than 150 milligram per the deciliters. Next one, supporting that things, uh, support uh, triglyceride uh, level is a uh, risk factors for these cardiovascular events. There is a it is uh, effect. Uh, it is uh, effect of uh, uh, blood triglyceride levels on this cardiovascular mortality and also all cause of this mortality. When it is dose related pattern, when this uh, triglyceride level is uh, um, the increase of the triglyceride level from 90 milligram per deciliter to the 200 milligram per deciliter, the all uh, cardiovascular mortality rate uh, incidence increases by 13 percent. And similarly. When the triglyceride level extend from the 30 to the 1 to 200 milligram per deciliter, this cardiovascular event total all cause of this mortality increases in the tune of the 12 percent. So, uh, uh, in spite of our LDL control, if the triglyceride level is high, there is a significantly um, cardiovascular event and cardiovascular mortality is more, which is evident from this study. And uh, another thing is that. Uh, what I have described previously, those patients who are who are uh, who don't have that uh, cardiovascular event, but uh, here here that is those patients who have acute coronary syndromes and those patients who are treated with these statins. In that patients, if triglyceride level fasting triglyceride level is high, then recurrent ischemic event is more. To supporting this uh, this notions, there is two study. The outcome study is there and micral study is there. And in outcome study, there is the uh, result of that outcome study was that significant decrease in this cardiovascular event in those with the triglyceride level less than 80 milligram per deciliter versus that of a 170 milligram per deciliters. And similarly, in micral study, cardiovascular events are less in those patients with the triglyceride level of 135 milligram per the deciliter when it is compared with the triglyceride level of 195 milligram per the deciliters. Next one, please. So, and uh, that high triglyceride level is associated with the excess risk of the ACVD. When the level of the triglyceride is less than 150, this is uh, estimated 10 years ACVD is uh, uh, 11%. And when it is increased to that of the 500 triglyceride levels, then uh, that um, ACVD risk factors, uh, it, 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 it become double. So there is an urgent need. There is an urgent need to address this unrecognized increased high triglyceride level, which is maybe the cause of the increased cardiovascular events. Next one, please. So our non-fasting triglyceride, that is a beautiful study, that is it's from Copenhagen uh, City Heart Study and Copenhagen General Population Study. And it is for the non-fasting triglyceride label. It's correlated with myocardial infarction ischemic heart disease and also death rate both in men and women. There is a linear correlations between these triglyceride, non-fasting triglyceride level and also these parameters of the cardiovascular outcomes. So coming to the next one. So uh, will treating this high TG reduce this cardiovascular event? This is the next question after that. We have discussed that LDL cholesterol so I have nicely described. Again, I have described that uh, a triglyceride, a high triglyceride level is associated with the cardiovascular risks and cardiovascular event. In spite of our uh, LDL cholesterol level is normal. Next is, uh, 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 will treating this high triglyceride levels, is it, uh, is it going to reduce this CV event? There are meta analysis of five landmark studies like ACCORD, FIL, BIP, HHS, and VHD. And from this meta analysis, it is evident that 35% relative risk reductions with the triglyceride lowering therapy in patients with baselines triglyceride level is more than 200, and in those patients, HDL cholesterol level is less than. 34 milligram per the deciliter. So uh, from this meta analysis, it is evident that uh, uh, lowering the triglyceride levels will having risk reduction so in the tune of the 35 percent. Then what are the C drugs or what are these uh, what are the things uh, in which we will go to reduce the triglyceride levels? Previously, we have the accord lipid study. 
it is with the statin plus uh, plus fibrate but during this follow up of this five years we are not getting any benefit from the uh, so from the addition of this fibrate but this accordion is the follow up study of this accord lipid study from this study it is evident that there may be this legacy effect spin fibrate is there so that uh, uh, the post trial follow up of the accord lipid study that is accordion which shows that the j fibrate uh, uh, there is improved survival treatment uh, survival in post treatments so that may be due to the j legacy of effect of the j fibrate so this finding support the reevaluations of this fibrate as an add on strategy to this study in order to reduce this cardiovascular risk in diabetes patients with those particularly have diabetic dyslipidemia next one next in our hand is sarolitazars it is a uh, new molecule in comparison to the other it is first approved dual ppr alpha and gamma agonist and it is approved by the dcgi for the treatment of the diabetic dyslipidemia and also hypertriglyceridemia in the type 2 diabetes patient those who have uncontrolled with the statin therapy but we have we don't have any cardiovascular outcome data supporting that sarolitazars so the next ones apart from that fibrate and sarolitazars we have do we have uh, the an, another japanese study named the jellies it is with the epa ecosa pantonic acids they are giving the studies in the 1900s it is in the 1990 around and this study is five years five years follow up study they are giving the ecosa pantonic acid in the dose of 1800 mg and the result of this study is that there is improvement in this primary outcomes and improvement of the all uh, all this metabolic means that that means the uh, decrease of the triglyceride and also decrease of the ldl cholesterol the next one's coming to that another another uh, study that is reduced it study in which Uh, they are giving um, that is uh, ecosa pentaethyl 4 grams it is this purified derivative of the uh, um, ecosa pentaenoic acids and here this patient uh, here that patients uh, there is good reduction of the uh, ldl uh, uh, triglyceride non hdl cholesterol and ldl cholesterol and reduction of 25% relative risk reduction of the primary outcomes and also cvd 20% reduction of the cvd so there is good result with the uh, ecosa pentaethyl 4 mg in this uh, uh, that is uh, reduced it trials we have another two trials like prominent and evaporate these are these ongoing trials the prominent trial is with the uh, pemi uh, pemi fibrates pemi uh, next ones next one rajiv the prominent uh, prominent study is particularly with type 1 diabetes uh, patients more than 10000 study participants are included from different countries and those patients who have the high triglyceride levels and low hdl cholesterol levels and they are with the moderate to high intensity statins in these study groups they are randomized to the placebo bid versus the pema fibrate bid and the, we are waiting for the result of that study the primary outcomes as it is previous is the myocardial infarction ischemic stroke unstable angina along with that the all causes of the mortality next one is the evaporated trials evaporated trial is particularly that of the ecosa pentyl ethyl ipe for 4 grams per day in divided doses and the result uh, this primary outcomes the interim result are after 9 month have for with us and the result of that is there is reduction of the plaque, uh, plaque volumes though the other results we are waiting this is 18 month study we are waiting for this the other result next coming to that next slide please next coming to this new one slide which we have discussed already that is pcsk9 uh, uh, inhibitors we have that is uh, our um, alirocumab and evolucumab and it has beneficial effect on reductions of the hldl cholesterol reductions of the vldl cholesterol and reductions of the non hdl cholesterol and also reduction of the lipoprotein a and those patients who are not controlled with statins it, uh, it is much more benefit with the uh, pcsk9 inhibitors the next ones and it is a, Uh, coming to the lipid associations of india that is uh, guidelines how to assess these patients in the first visit in the next visit but the, 
at the end of this end of this uh, slides they have recommended that for this routine screening non fasting lipid level is recommended so any patients non fasting say if you are doing non fasting um, uh, lip, uh, lipid levels in that scenario you may go for the g uh, ldl c cholesterol or non hdl cholesterol measurement in non fasting next one and the l l m b c lipid association of for india 2016 recommendation they give more emphasis to the non hdlc um, uh, components as a primary tar target for the acvd prevention the next one the meta analysis from that Uh, from the G eight trials, that uh, those patients who have good control of the G LDL C cholesterols and they have the high non HDL cholesterol, the relative risk of the CB event, those who have uh, that high non HDL cholesterol, uh, cholesterol is thirty two in the thirty two percent as compared to those who have the control non HDL cholesterol that is two percent. So. Uh, it is uh, it is evident from the meta analysis that non hdl cholesterol has a significant role in this acvd so coming to the next one this lip yeah i have described that things then uh, lipid associations of india recommendations for deter for determining the ldl cholesterol role in diabetes is they have decided, they have divided diabetes into two groups diabetes without uh, acvd and diabetes with acvd if the diabetes without uh, without acvd no target organ damage the goal is less than 70 with the target organ damage the goal is less than 50 then coming to the diabetes with acvd they have categorized into two category extreme if this patient is having multi Multiple uh, risk factors, ACVD risk factor or polyvascular disease, they have categorized as extreme case, extreme uh, extreme case risk. That means category B. And here in that case, the goal is less than 30. And in category A, when this uh, without target organ damage or more than two risk factor is present, they have categorized it to uh, category one. And the goal of for goal of LDL should be. 50 and in uh, ex uh, in ex uh, some scenario you may extend up to 30 ldl cholesterol goal up to 30 so coming to the last uh, last one that is uh, it is how allergy for the c screening and management of the hypertriglyceridemia as i have described hypertriglyceridemia is also important uh, important during this cardiovascular for the cardiovascular event if the non fasting tg is less than 200 mg per the deciliter then that is for lifestyle modification is there if the non fast non fasting tg more than 200 then It is, if it is less than 150 lifestyle modifications it requires no drug treatment is required the again 150 to 500 along with the lifestyle modifications you may go for this statin plus minus ezetimibe and in some scenario if this uh, um, triglyceride table is more than 500 in that scenario you go for this fibrin directly along with that additional therapy you may go for this statin ezetimibe or omega 3 fatty acids and in some resistant scenario you may go for this PCSK9 inhibitors. So to conclude my presentation, ACVD is common in the present with the type 2 diabetes, but uh, it increases the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And the diabetic dyslipidemia, which include the increased triglyceride, increased LDL cholesterol, and increase uh, the decrease of LDL cholesterol, it's quite common. And 70% of the diabetes patients they are suffering diabetic dyslipidemia. And only uh, priority is to be uh, priority is to reduce to the LDL cholesterol with statin, ezetimibe, or plus minus PCSK inhibitors is our primary goal. And if the cardiovascular event is there, additional need to pay attention. to the reduce the triglyceride and also non hdl cholesterol reductions for triglyceride reductions or non hdl cholesterol reductions we have our fibrate is there our eicosapentaenoic acid is there ip is there and uh, sarolitaz are used with us and along with that P pcsk inhibitor is with the us so most important thing is lifestyle modifications is in every stage of this disease for good good uh, controls of the lipid is required in every stage that is the, that's the end of this, uh, my presentation thank you everyone for this thank you madam uh, request to dr raut rai sir yeah thank you thank you we'll have discussion at the end
just uh, five minutes back, Dr. Porida rang me. He is not able to connect. Dr. Porida, are you online? So I am introducing uh, next talk is familial hyperlipidemia, one of the rare condition. Actually, it is not so rare. It is lesser known, underdiagnosed, and undertreated problem. So to show more light on this underdiagnosed entity, I will request Dr. Chabi Satpati to start his start our presentation. Dr. Satpati, please. The Dr. Porida is online, sir. Yeah, uh, Porida is online. Now, uh, my... You tell tell few uh, lines. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, next topic is familiar hypercholesteremia. It is the commonest among all genetic disorders and one child born with familial hypercholesteremia in every minute. Advances in genotyping and phenotyping technology in last decade have led to the marked progress in our understanding of the genetics of familial hypercholesteremia. Genetic analysis using Mendelian randomization principle used successfully for explaining causal contribution to heart disease. Such investigations have confirmed causal role for LDL, but it suggests a causal role for PG and cast doubt on HDL. Sir, it is an autosomal dominant disorder and defect in LDL receptor activity. In heterozygous, one in 500 in general population accounts for 5% of the premature MI. And in homozygous, it is one in one million in population. And here, cholesterol, total cholesterol more be uh, eight, more than 800 to 1000 annually and do not survive to the adulthood without liver transplantation. For lipid panel, if LDL is more than 190, and total cholesterol more than 290, secondary causes to be ruled out. And if there is no secondary causes, fasting lipid panel should be advised, and history of family history of premature CAD to be evaluated. And signs of Janssen's uh, tendon, if there is not that there, then genetic analysis to be done. The topic will be detailed, elaborated um, by Dr. Chabi Satpathima. Chabi Satpathima, madam, please. Hello? Dr. Chabi Satpathima, uh, start. start. Yeah. A very good evening to all the eminent live panelists, the panelists from my own state, attendees of the webinar, and the organizers. Being the last speaker on behalf of LAI, am I audible? Yes, madam. Yes. Yeah. Really I am supposed to talk on familial hypercholesterolemia. Familial hypercholesterolemia now in familial hypercholesterolemia or FH. So this is a beautiful the world columns of prevalence dark brown seeing the maximum prevalence of FH in the founder population in Canada and South Africa. The is not known. And this meta-analysis of 195 countries, one person the countries do not have balance known to them. India is one of them. We do not know how many patients which are there in our country. We need to change it. So, FH is a common genetic cause of rheumatosity and of It results in markedly reduced hepatic 
consequent acquisition of ldn as rightly pointed out one baby is being born with fh every minute fh is thus under diagnosed under treated and systematic screening strategies are inconsistently implemented globally not in our country only now this is typically caused by mutations in the common three things ldl receptor the apoe b and pcsk9 the ldl receptors expressed on the surface of the hepatocytes they bind to the apoe b on the ldl particle inducing endocytosis of that the pcsk9 is responsible for degradation of the ldl receptors in the lysosomes and they are usually say gain in function the apoe b acts as a ligand binding the ldl to the receptor this another that is the ldl receptor adapter protein which mediates internalization of the particle through the clathrin coated pits into the hepatocytes responsible for the recessive gene recessive fh so out of the three genes mutation the ldl receptor amounts for the maximum 60 to 80% apoe b some 1 to 10% pcsk9 than 5% and the unknown is still 20 to 40% the yield of the genetic testing is higher if the patient has a definite fh some 80% versus that of probable and possible the yield is around 5 to 60% the ld receptor adapter protein is responsible for the recessive form now inheritance of mutation in the gene from one parent is responsible for heterozygous form from both parents is responsible for homozygous form Additional alterations in the lipoprotein profile in FH may involve elevation of the lipoprotein A, elevated TG-rich lipoprotein remnants, dysfunctional HDLs. Collectively, they contribute to accelerated atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease. Indeed, every 10 milligram increment in the non-HDL cholesterol is associated with an increase in atherosclerosis equivalent to aging of the person by one year. elevated circulating markers of vascular inflammation and endothelial dysfunction are also present in these children with fh reflecting very early atherogenesis now apart from this mutation we should not forget other risk factors for acvd like high blood pressure diabetes obesity in arsia and the right they should also be looked for apart from the mutation in the gene in the patient of f now six minimal of ldlc is the amount required to reach the threshold so that a patient will have coronary heart disease in patients who are healthy this level is reached at the age of 55 that is in the sixth decade however if a patient is homozygous at they reach this level at second decade at 12.5 years and those who are heterozygous they reach at 35 years and depending on the stage whether you have started early or late it reaches the threshold at 48 to 53 years so normal patients reaching at 55 versus homozygous at 12.5 years that is the importance of familial ha now coming to the prevalence out of all genetic disorders this familial hypercholesterolemia is quite common the incidence being 5 in 1000 live births versus that of all others less than 1% per 1000 live births so it is a common genetic disorder now we know what is a found fact certain subpopulation experience a higher frequency due to the presence of this founder effect for example in the south africa maybe in canada maybe in lebanon this phenomenon is characterized by the loss of genetic variability in that particular location due to mutation of few individuals carrying a high frequency of fh causing mutation establishing new subpopulation there in geographic and cultural isolation from the larger population they suffer more from prevalence may be 1 in 100 these founder populations that have been previously identified include the french canadians 
the Ashkenazi Jews, the Christian Lebanese, and the South African Afrikaners. Now, this is one interesting slide that it showed the prevalence of familial hypercholesterolemia in the general population is 1 in 313. The patient having ischemic heart disease, the prevalence increases by tenfold, 1 in 31. Prevalence in premature ischemic disease, 20-fold higher, 1 in 15. And once we come to severe hypercholesterolemia, defined as LDLC more than 190, the prevalence of FH is 1 in 14. So every 14th patient of severe hypercholesterolemia is likely to be suffering from FH. So coming to the clinical presentations, as we know, mutation of the LDLC is the most common genetic mutation leading to FH. It could be heterozygote, could be a homozygote variety. In the heterozygote variety, the prevalence is 1 in 500 worldwide, but the homozygous is very, very rare, 1 in million persons worldwide. This patient of heterozygotes, they have one mutated LED from one of the parents. The homozygous have two mutated LED from both the parents. The total call is 350 to 500, versus that of beyond 500 to 1000. LDL cholesterol is 100 versus beyond 600. The receptor expression is around half, maybe 50% of the expected. He is almost absent. The receptor activity is below 2%. The definition of absent receptor activity is below 2% of expected. And the heterozygous form usually happens to 3 fold versus that of in homozygous 6 to 10 fold. Heterozygous of MI at the age of 30 to 40 years in the fourth decade versus that of the second decade in early childhood. So that is the clinical presentation. And we have to know the typical manifestations on the skin. They may have gentle asthmas in the period there before the age of 20 to 25, not be, be, be after that. This is very common in the elderly patients. You have to have gentle asthma in the periorbital area within 20 to 25, below that. And arcus corny, partial or could be a complete arcus cornealis that should be present before the age of 55, not after that. And Achilles tendon janthomas or tendon janthomas are very specific for this disease. Tuberous janthomas or planar janthomas can also be present. So these are the typical manifestations on the skin. Now, this is a typical patient. We are very careful by dealing with a male young patient, or maybe around 45. What is the history? He is a case of familial hypercholesterolemia with some janthomas. He had CABG at the age of 23, redo CABG at the age of 36. PCI into the graft at the age of 40 with severe calcific aortic stenosis died at the age of 45 while waiting for tower. So this is how a patient may progress life. We have to be very careful. Regarding the lipid profile, the total cholesterol is 370 and the HDL, I mean the LDL is more than 300. Now, regarding the vascular profile, the picture is clearly showing there is extensive calcification of the aortic root, arch of the aorta. This is the calcification of the aorta. Now, we have infrarenal abdominal aorta, calcification of lateral internal and external iliac arteries. Now, coming to diagnosis, how to diagnose this disorder? Now, we have to have some lipid profile. We have to take the clinical history of the proband as well as the family members, physical examination in both, and the genetic study. Now, after including all these, we have some criteria proposed. One proposed by UK, that is a nice guideline, says Simon Room criteria, one by the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network, and the rest for diagnosing homozygous familial hypercholesterol. Now, coming to this most commonly used Simon Room diagnostic criteria, we have five points, number one to number five, total cholesterol more than 290 and LDL more than 190 in adults, 
Number two, tendon janthomas in the patient or in the first or second degree related to the program. Now, evidence of mutation in the LDL receptor, APOB100 or PCSK9. Family history of infarction before the age of 50 in the second degree relatives, before the age of 60 in the first degree. Family history also in the second and first degree relatives. What is these five points? patient has one plus two or else only three, then it's a case of definite hypercholesterolemia. And one plus four or one plus five. So that is what the Simon Room criteria is saying. Now, next common is the Dutch lipid clinic network criteria. They have different points allotted, family history, the clinical history of the patient, the physical examination finding, the lipid profile, and the DNA analysis. Scoring goes from 1 to 8. The 8 score has been given to LDL beyond 330 and 2. The DNA analysis positive for mutation at LDL receptor ApoB and PCSK9. So definite familial hypercholesterolemia requires a point scoring of more than 8, which says that only DNA analysis positive mutation of these receptors cannot diagnose definite familial hypercholesterolemia. You have to have another point. So unlike the Simon Room, which only says that mutation is a definite case, the DLNC says that mutation should have another point for definite familial hypercholesterol. For probable 6 to 8, possible 3 to 5, unlike below 3. Now coming to the homozygous effect, the genetic component of two mutant alleles is required, either receptor or ApoB or PCSK9 gene locus. You have to have two mutant alleles to say it's a homozygous FH or else the LDL cholesterol should be more than 500 and treated, treated more than 300 together with cutaneous or tendon janthoma before the age of 10 or untreated elevated LDLC consistent with the heterozygous FH in both the parents. So this is for diagnosing now, very interesting, it has been recently shown in a lot that less than 2% of individuals with LDL cholesterol more than 190 had FH mutation. So it's not that common, 2% with LDL more than 190 will have a mutation. Conversely, 27% of the LDL receptor mutation carriers do have also a low cholesterol, less than 130, very surprising. So we have to take all the criteria into consideration while diagnosing FH. Now the live expert consensus recommends universal thing of all individuals prior to the age of 20 or at the time of college going. So it's very important. All the individuals should be screened before the age of 20 or at the time of college entry. And this has to be done much earlier maybe at the age of two years or before 10 years, if the patient has a strong family history of heterozygous or homozygous FH or premature CAT. Lai also recommends that the Simon Brun criteria for diagnosis of FH should be used more frequently because it is easier to remember this criteria in the busy outpatient clinic. And the cascade screening of the second and first relatives is also recommended. Once a diagnosis is made in the index case on the proband, cascade testing has to be started, maybe clinical or maybe genetic, among the first and second degree relatives, and if feasible also, the third degree biological relatives. So what are the current treatments? Of course, lifestyle issue is a must. Aphoresis and liver transplant as meant for the patients who are very resistant, and the drugs, statins, agitimibe, PCSK9 inhibitors, mypomersan, and lomitapai. Now, how is the survival benefit with high dose of statin in FH patients? Now, 27 outpatient lipid clinic patients were taken into meta-analysis. From 2,000 patients were included. They showed that if statin is started very early in patients of FH, then the cumulative event-free survival is very high. 
around 80%. We follow the patient for about five years. Versus the patient of FH, if they are not giving statin at the end of 10 to 12 years, this may be around 35%. So the cumulative even free survival is much better in FH patients provided you started statin at the very early age. And this is not also a very high dose. Even a moderate dose statin is very effective. And the p-value is very significant, falling to 0.001. Now, coming to other drugs. Now, the recent trials, one trial is the TOSIN trial. This TOSIN trial is open-level single-arm study with 300 patients have included both the homozygous and the severe heterozygous and followed up to 4.1 years of duration. They showed that once they are given evolocumab, c 9 mono body is well tolerated and there's a large reduction in the LDA level in both homozygous or severe heterozygous. However, the reduction in heterozygous are two around 80% versus that of homozygous around 35% and the even rate is also very low 2.7 per year versus that 4.7 in other trials and 26% I mean one quarter of the patients on aphoresis have stopped aphoresis after starting evolocumab, subcutaneous injection every two weeks. Another interesting trial on anirocumab, the trial name is Odyssey Homozygous FH trial. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized, parallel group phase 3 trial with patient number 300, equally divided in 1 is to 1 ratio, anirocumab in one and placebo in the other, with a 12 weeks of double-blind, 12 weeks of open level and followed for eight weeks. So on the contrary, here the follow-up is for about 32 weeks versus that of 4.1 years for the other trial of TOSIC. But very interesting, here also with alirocumab injection every two weeks, there's a drastic fall in the LDLC level versus that of the placebo and they were continued for 22 weeks. So alirocumab was generally well tolerated with a safety profile comparable to that of the placebo. So this is about alirocumab, subcutaneous injection every two weeks. In Clisaran, the third drug has come out in 2020 anyway. This is in the OEM9 trial. It's also a double-blind, randomized phase three trial. Now, in is a small interfering RNA that inhibits the PCSK9 synthesis. So in contrary to the other drugs, which are monoclonal antibodies to the PCSK9, targeting the PCSK9 in the circulation, this interferes in the intracellular level at the level of synthesis. That is the difference. Now, placebo versus implicitaran, they showed there's a significant drop in the LDLC level, whether you are considering the percentage change or you are considering the absolute LDLC level. So, it falls, this meant only for the both would receive in Kisaran a 48% reduction of LDLC and the P was very significant and the dosing is very infrequent. We are giving at one month, three month, nine month and 15 month. They are receiving two injections per year. The injection is six month P. I mean every six months they are receiving only one injection in contrary to others they were receiving every two weeks and this also acceptable safety profile. And the last which came in 2020 ACC scientific session is Evina Cumab. This Cumab is a monoclonal antibody targeting the angiopoietin like three protein. We have eight such protein. It targets the three angiopoietin like three protein. It reduces the LDL cholesterol by about 49%. The of lipoprotein lipage and the endothelial lipage so as increases all three LDL traits, whether it is LDL, HDL or TG, it increases all by inhibiting this by this monoclonal antibody, even of humab, all three traits of LDL are reduced, whether LDL, whether HDL or TG. And this is the double-blind study, Evinokima versus placebo at the end of 12, 24 weeks. There's a drastic reduction with the P falling to less than 0.001. Some 65 patients were only tried, 
only in the homozygous FH group. Now, this patient, some three quarter, were already in a triple therapy, including PCSK9 inhibitor, and one third were also on apheresis. So, on the top of the usual lipid lowering therapy, including PCSK9 inhibitors, immunocumab, I mean injection infusion, IV infusion of 15 milligrams per kg, thus a drastic rejection of LDLC cholesterol level. And this reduction is irrespective of the LDL receptor function. Where is a good number of receptor or there's a less number of receptor with this nominal variety or nominal variety in both the groups, there's a drastic reduction of LDLC cholesterol. So what is the National Lipid Association saying regarding apheresis? The indication for apheresis are the patient has to have in the homozygous form LDL cholesterol more than 300 totally after six months the lifestyle modification and conventional drugs, either the target is not reached or is intolerant or unresponsive. Similarly, for the heterozygous, if the LDL cholesterol more than 300, for LDL more than 200, you have to have more than or equal to two risk conventional factors or LPA more than 50 mg per cent. If the LDL is more than 160 only, you have to have established vascular disease or diabetes. So these are the indications for apheresis one could try after six months of conventional treatment following lifestyle modification. Now regarding our recommendation, Lipid Association of India recommendation of 2017, the children in homozygous should have a target of less than 70, in heterozygous less than 100. Coming to the adults, homozygous should have a target of less than 50, and heterozygous less than 70. Or else you can see that the 50% reduction of the baseline LDLC cholesterol is mandated. Then came the modification of the on Now, after things in 16 cities all over our country, spanning over 11 months with 162 eminent epidemiologists. Forms, the RDL goal of 70 has now come to 50. The patient has some atrospheric cardiovascular disease because he belongs to the extreme risk category A. And below 30 is optional, provided you have a shared decision between the physician and the patient. Because the higher treatment with PCSK9 inhibitors are very costly, maybe causing around 4 to 5 lakh a year, you have to have a shared decision with the physician as well as the patient party after explaining the risk and the benefit. Similarly, for the homozygous variety, from 50, it has come to 30 now with the 2020 LI recommendation, provided he has some atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease because they belong to extreme risk category B. So this is the change from 2017. So what is the conclusion? FH and actually left desert is already underdiagnosed and undertreated. We don't know what is the prevalence in our country, but it can be easily diagnosed on clinical grounds also. Not necessarily mutation is study is required. And cascade screening is a must for all the first and second degree relatives, provided you have an index case or proband with you. And therapeutic options are now available. We have important study drugs now available for us. And we should also see about the other risk factors responsible for ACVD. So thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now, <clears throat> I would like to invite Dr. Anger, the patron of the Lipid Association of India. Dr. Anger, please. Good evening. Um, Good evening, sir. Um, with the permission of the chair, I think I'll request uh, Dr. Anpuri to say a few words on LDL cholesterol, followed by Dr. Nasingan, a few words on diabetes lipidemia. Then I will say a few words on FH. Then we'll start the question answer session. Dr. Aman. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I think there was some uh, technical problem today in the two of our presentation. 
Yeah, uh, I think internet. Uh, uh, yeah. So, no problem. problem. Yeah, so okay. I'll try to you know fill some of uh, uh, the things which he has missed because of the problem. Now, now let us go into uh, uh, my comments. Comments are to justify uh, extreme risk group and uh, to justify target of uh, uh, thirty milligram LDL cholesterol in type B extreme risk category. Now you, you all know that all patients of coronary artery disease do not behave in the same way. There are few patients who come to you with recurrent uh, new symptoms uh, shortly in six months' time, one year, and many of these patients remain a case of a stable coronary artery disease. They go for a long way without uh, any uh, subsequent cardiovascular event. Uh, this can be explained uh, very nicely in this slide. You can see that uh, this is. Uh, those patients with previous myocardial infarction and it, this is uh, the primary endpoints are three years uh, mace cardiovascular death mi and ischemic stroke and these are the nine risk indicator these are the clinical variables and if none of this clinical variable is present the chances of having recurrent cardiovascular event in three years is 3.5% as the number of these variables increases or indicator increases to more than 7%, seven, it, the incidence becomes 58.6. This means 58% of these patients are going to have some event in next three years' time. That you can understand that uh, how uh, dangerous this situation is. Now, to uh, explain this uh, extreme risk group, uh, on what basis we have created this extreme risk group? To simplify it, uh, if uh, those patients who have 10 years ASCVD risk of uh, uh, 20 to 29 percent, they are very high risk group according to LAI uh, recommendation. Those who have uh, 30 to 39 percent chances of having ASCVD event in 10 years, they are extreme risk category A. And those who have more than 40 percent chance of having cardiovascular event in next 10 years is category B. And we have given the goal of less than 50. This was recommended in 2016. In category A, the goal still remains 50. But depending upon uh, the clinical you know, profile of the patient, you have an optional goal of less than 30 milligram. In category B, there is no word optional. This is 30 milligram per deciliter of LDL cholesterol. Now, I'll, uh, I'll try to justify that how this extreme risk category varies, why we have brought on the LDL cholesterol to less than 30 milligrams. I'm going to, uh, this is a heart protection study, it's a, a study uh, which will simplify our further discussion. Here you can see that those patients of diabetes without coronary artery disease, they have 5.5% cardio, residual cardiovascular event. Those diabetic patients with CHD, the events were 17.4%. This is a patient on simvastatin 40 milligram. And those patients of coronary artery disease without diabetes, it was 8.5%. So just combination of these coronary artery disease and diabetes increases these events uh, in much higher as compared to uh, those without heart disease and those without diabetes. Now, uh, to uh, clarify it further now, uh, this is a LDL cholesterol CVD risk curve. The green arrow shows patients of uh, CHD plus diabetes and the red arrow shows patients of CSD without diabetes. Now, 180, at a level of 180 milligram, you can see there is a big gap between the two. Now, based upon heart protection study in which the mean LDL cholesterol was around 90 milligram, you can see there was 8.9% uh, uh, cardiovascular, recurrent cardiovascular event or residual events. When the level of LDL cholesterol is brought down to uh, say 70 milligram, from 8.9, it comes down to 4%. When it is brought down to 50 milligram, as is our recommendation, the events become 3%. And when it is 30 milligram, there is hardly any difference between the two groups. So this means whatever benefit we could uh, we could have got from L LDL cholesterol reduction. Coming to 30 milligram, we have achieved maximum uh, benefit of LDL cholesterol lowering. Beyond that, I don't think we are going to have an additional benefit in this group of patients. 
Now these are the patients. Uh, uh, I've made a chart in which uh, these are high risk patients, and you can see here that those patients with diabetes and coronary artery disease, they have residual risk of uh, absolute risk reduction of 2.7, and if there is no diabetes, then absolute risk reduction is 1.6. Just imagine. in patients with coronary artery disease and polyvascular uh, bed involvement means all three vessels uh, vascular bed involved means cad plus peripheral artery disease plus cerebral vascular disease absolute risk reduction is 13 and nnt is 8 this means you treat 100 patient and you prevent 12 events even patients of post cabg absolute risk reduction is 8.3 and nnt of 12 this you means you uh, you prevent 8 events if you treat 100 patients and patients of diabetes cad and peripheral vascular disease absolute risk reduction is 9.3 with nnt of 11 so this means these group of clinical patients this clinical profile this this group of patients of coronary artery disease these morbidities they will be benefited to a greatest possible extent if we aggressively lower the ldl cholesterol based upon fourier trial which is 30 mg and some of the improved it trial in which uh, Uh, we achieved uh, ldl cholesterol uh, around 30 mg and in our dosi outcome study also we got some group of patients in which ldl cholesterol was 15 mg now this is our basis why we came to uh, ldl cholesterol of 30 mg this is based upon fourier trial and even the cholesterol treatment trial is collaborated and also shows that if you lower ldl cholesterol from 70 down to 30 mg you reduce 37% a miss now here uh, this is another study is an odyssey outcome trial is a post hoc analysis you, this is the the primary trial means uh, and these are the post hoc analysis you can see here that uh, in the primary trial the ldl was reduced from 93 to 80 53 and there was 15% reduction in event in this post hoc analysis when the ldl cholesterol was brought down from 73 to 15 There was 29% reduction in event. Just see, bringing down LDL from uh, 53 to uh, 15, how significant reduction in cardiovascular event is there, and that is similar benefit was seen in Fourier trial also. But still, there are residual events in this. There are 5.2% of patients of Fourier trial, despite having LDL of 20 milligram, they had cardiovascular event. So these events are not. Uh, cannot be you know greatly reduced by further lowering ldl cholesterol but we have to make sure that patient follows a adequate uh, therapeutic lifestyle you control odd modifiable risk factor try to achieve non hdl cholesterol and lipoprotein a small targets treat patients of diabetes with hglt2 inhibitor so these are additional things we should do to bring down this uh, residual cardiovascular events uh, now let us see what uh, international guidelines says now because most of us uh, trust uh, uh, international guidelines and uh, a shade lower we trust our indian guidelines but let us see what uh, international guidelines says according to acc 2000 guidelines those patients who are very high risk ascvd means ascvd with comorbidity and if the patient ldl is more than 70 mg on maximal dose of statin and azetamide you add pcs can i so that is what they say that if ldl is say 80 mg despite high intensity statin and azetamide you add pcs can i now for example i give pcs can i to a person with ldl cholesterol of 80 mg with who is on high intensity statin plus azetamide what i am going to achieve ldl cholesterol of 30 mg that is exactly we what we are recommending in our on this uh, uh, new recommendations now diabetes the comorbidities they say that you give high intensity statin now if we take the same patient in which we have given uh, you know moderate intensity statin and if that patient has 
comorbidity or target organ damage and what will happen we'll have an additional 15 to 20% reduction uh, uh, with the high intensity statin as compared to moderate intensity statin so we will get ldl cholesterol around less than 50 mg this is what we recommended uh, in 2016 that patients of diabetes with comorbidities diabetes with target organ damage they fall into very high risk group and the target for ldl cholesterol in this group is less than 50 mg european guideline says patients of ascvd clinical or imaging bring down ldl cholesterol to 50 55 mg now issue is what should be the target of ldl cholesterol i am talking of european guidelines they say patient of ascvd even subclinical it's a imaging diagnosis means you have done ct angio and you have found that there was some deposit if the target is 50 mg in this group of patient then i would like to know what target will be in those patient with post cbg diabetes polyvascular disease i think uh, uh, 50 or 30 i think you have to decide uh, will you like to keep it 50 or 30 based upon whatever information i have given to you now question is uh, safety part of it remember that we have enough evidence based upon improved it trial fourier trial and odyssey outcome trial that having ldl cholesterol of 30 mg is absolutely safe there have no, not been any adverse significant adverse effect seen with the drug neither with uh, statin nor with azetamide uh, nor with the now 5 years study of uh, osler study in which pcs avolumumab was given for 5 years and there were no significant adverse effect with this so uh, in in a short in, in about 5 to 10 minutes i have tried to justify um, the extreme risk group and these targets and i think uh, we should be very sincere towards our patient in uh, achieving the targets depending upon the category risk category to which this patient belongs to thank you the same on board unmute uh, good evening everyone thank you sir uh, for giving me this opportunity um the technical problems had interfered with their uh, delivery of uh, information but yeah anyhow we will try to tell something about the diabetic dyslipidemia currently we are witnessing an epidemic of uh, type 2 diabetes in our country there is also an increase in the prevalence of obesity the prevalence of metabolic recent studies conducted in our country had revealed that about 33.3% of our population is suffering from metabolic syndrome the same thing is true even in united states the recent study shows 35% of the population are seem to be having the problems of metabolic syndrome the concentration of risk factors what is important is to recognize the earliest in which the earliest insult is the atherogenic dyslipidemia appearance in people with metabolic syndrome characterized by high triglycerides very low hdl and then the high proportion of small dense ldl cholesterol with increased content i think uh, this atherogenic dyslipidemia actually attacks the increased amount of production of the pro inflammatory factors like high sensitive crp pro coagulant factors like pi 1 and fibrinogen in this milieu the vascular territories of these patients the metabolic syndrome suffer from the insult not only from the atherogenic dyslipidemia but also from the pro inflammatory and pro coagulant factors which creates a lot of havoc and produces the endothelial dysfunction with the ongoing abdominal adiposity in the insulin resistance this continues for some time and the patients develop most of coronary artery disease and sometimes people with the metabolic syndrome they succumb to the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease it is clearly seen that not only the ascvd risk is high but also the mortality due to ascvd risk is also on the higher side in people with metabolic syndrome compared to people without metabolic syndrome if that is a situation in metabolic syndrome you should look at the other parameters which are considered as a constellation of risk factors to start with uh, you have only fasting hyperglycemia mild or impaired glucose tolerance that may be a situation which we call as pre diabetes in this group of people but they would not develop categoric diabetes it may take at least 5 to 7 years or even sometimes 10 years also 
when these people get into the problem of the ketogenic diabetes. But we need to realize that the morbidity and mortality of the ACVD risk actually occurs more commonly in people with pre-diabetes and they have this atherogenic dyslipidemia. If that is a situation when we realize these are the problems that are encountered, we need to be very careful in analyzing the problems in people with diabetes. So the diabetic dyslipidemia has to be treated aggressively. The Lipid Association of India goes a step ahead of the ACCH guidelines recommendation. Between 40 and 75 years of age, you need to put the patient with diabetes, everybody on type, on statin therapy. They say that area of patients between 20 and 39 years of age need to receive a statin only when have an additional risk factor. But Lipid Association of India strongly believes with the problem of pre-diabetes and the ASCVD risk in this group of patients with atherogenic dyslipidemia, which started very, very early in the life of an individual with diabetes, I think we are fully justified in recommending people with diabetes need to take the statins at the time when they are at a diagnosis of diabetes. So when you take a diagnosis of diabetes, you should see that the patient receives statin. That is the most important valid information which the Lipid Association of India is trying to propagate. And number two is that type 1 diabetic patients, though it is not uncommon in our country, it is common, not common in our country, is, is clearly seen that the ASCVD risk is higher in type 1 diabetic patients because they live for a longer period. If the risk profile is also the same when compared to type 2 diabetic patients, I think there should not be any sort of discrepancy in the management of people with the ASCVD risk in type 1 diabetes also. They need to be treated on par with type 2 diabetic patients. I think uh, these messages uh, should go uh, to all our uh, people who have come for this meeting and including the specialists in endocrinology and theology. Thank you, Yes, uh, sir. I'll say a few words on FH. Fortunately, FH didn't have much of a technical problem when Dr. Sarpati was presenting and she gave us a very good account of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, I would like to add a few points in addition to whatever she has shown. <clears throat> Can you see the slides? No, sir, not yet. No, not shared it, sir. Put the click on the first slide, sir. It is appearing on the other side, left side. Yeah, it has come. Okay. Um. Yes, sir, it is appearing. Yeah. You saw the slide which she showed in one of the slides, what LAI recommends. You see at the bottom of that, we have mentioned that you should include serum LPA in the screening. So don't forget when you're doing the screening, to include LPA screening in all your subjects. The reasons are many. One of them is, she also mentioned that we should not forget about other risk factors which could be present in these patients of FH. And another risk factor is again this lipoprotein A level. If the lipoprotein A level is high, the cardiovascular risk goes up much higher. Look at this uh, uh, Safe Art Spanish registry. Those patients who had LPA more than 50, the survival was very poor. And you see the Copenhagen Demic Population Study, where the FH patients, where FH LPA was more than 50, their hazard ratio increased to nearly five times. The other point I would like to mention about LPA or LDL cholesterol is whenever you measure or estimate LDL cholesterol, please remember it includes the cholesterol which is present in LPA. Whether you do beta quantification or free rod formula. So remember that. And other point when coming to treatment, when you give statins, you see the LPA marginally increases, increase, except probably some studies with the beta was statin has shown minimal decrease. Otherwise, all statins generally increase, not very significantly, the marginal increase is there. When you look at the diet changes, follow a strict diet again, 
LPA doesn't come down, it does go up again marginally. Though here the hypothesis is that it probably increases the large LPA particles, which are not very harmful. If you look at the drugs available for us, niacin was one of the drugs which did bring down LPA, but we saw the clinical outcomes were not at all beneficial. The only things that help them is probably AFRSS and the new drugs which are coming out against this LPA. Of course, PCSK nanometers bring it down uh, partly by nearly 20%. And this is the uh, Fourier study which showed that it did bring down the LPA and it did improve the cardiovascular outcome in those patients where LPA also came down significantly. And Elirokmab that the ODC outcome style also showed those who had high LPA and when the LDL cholesterol was brought down, they also benefited much. So at present, we have only high-intensity statin. You don't meet the target, then you go on to azetimide. Again, you don't meet the target, you go to ACSK inhibitor. But once the benpedoic acid is available, you could add benpedoic acid before you go on to ACSK inhibitor. Other drug, uh, Dr. Sapati has mentioned about, about Evinacumab, which acts irrespective of the LDL receptor activity. And uh, this, we are all becoming familiar now. LA has introduced this extreme risk category. Uh, patients with heterozygous, we are high risk category. Patients with homozygous, they are very high risk. And uh, heterozygous FH with ASCVD or high risk features will come into extreme risk category A. And HOFH patients with ASCVD or very high risk features come into extreme risk category B. And accordingly, we have these uh, targets laid down. The targets are no doubt difficult to achieve. Somebody has rightly asked, and asked whether it is hypothetical or just uh, theoretical or not practical. It is possible to reduce the LDL cholesterol less than 50 or 30 in patients who have heterozygous familiar hypercholesterol family. It is problematic and very difficult to achieve in HOFH patients at present. But with the aphoresis becomes easily accessible to many patients, and with the newer drugs coming, we hope that we'll be able to achieve these goals. LA activities, Dr. Raman already mentioned that uh, India represented this uh, FH Global Summit in uh, uh, two years ago. And um, he also mentioned about the uh, free drugs being made available and free genetic testing made available to poor patients of FH if you have any. And you could enter this website lipid.net.in to contribute your cases to FH registry. We have about uh, 55 cases of homozygous familiar hepatocellular in, in our registry so far. Uh, one uh, trial which uh, LA is going to start shortly is an international study and LA is going to be the coordinator in our country. It is a novel NTPCSK9 recombinant fusion protein which has shown to decrease LDL cholesterol by nearly 70% safely. This will be compared with PCSK9 inhibitor in a crossover study to evaluate patients uh, of homozygous FH. And if this drug is approved, and this drug is going to be supplied free of cost to the participants in this trial. So again, if you have patients of homozygous FH, kindly contact LDL. I'd like to end up my small presentation with this impressive statement for you to take home this statement. You never find an individual with FH. You always find a family. So that means if you detect a case, please do cascade screening and find out more cases. Thank you. Now, uh, chairpersons to take up the questions. I think. Do you have a question? Do you want me to read out? Yeah, we have the question, sir. So, yeah. first question is from Dr. Deepak Ranjan. I think he has a lot of questions, Dr. Deepak Ranjan. <laughs> uh, homozygous FH is still termed as often disease. Should it be termed differently after LD labor? Sir, that on the top, other question is there. The first question is regarding gene hypothesis. 
it will go to the up sir yeah thrifty gene hypothesis yes yeah, yeah. Uh, thrifty gene hypothesis is one of the things uh, uh, put forward to explain very high incidence or prevalence of diabetes obesity and public cardiovascular disease but nothing and you want to say anything on thrifty gene nothing is known to everyone that it is one of the theories or hypothesis which has been proved the studies also that uh, the the problem of diabetes hypercholesteremia hypertension comes to that yeah okay uh, dr mark you want to add anything on the trip sure. uh, that that's good enough okay. so dr other my top question was the homozygous effects often disease i don't think is not any longer uh, often disease with so much of awareness coming up drugs being up efrs is being available but in india i think fh is still an often disease because awareness is poor detection is poor treatment is poor next question is uh, ldl lar targets of fh or to 70 mg appears hypothetical i think this i answered it is not hypothetical it is uh, extremely possible to achieve it in patients who have both heterozygous variety homozygous probably difficult but in future i think with new drugs the defrasis becomes easily available we can bring it down we have i mean not here we have a few cases in western countries who are already reached an age of 50 to 60 for taking their defrasis regularly ramani sir uh, excuse me sir yes uh, i have a case of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia he is a 22 year old boy and uh, he has undergone cabg and despite being on op- uh, 80 mg of atorvastatin and uh, azetimib of uh, 20 mg uh, we have never been successful in achieving his ldl cholesterol to below 120 or so and he can't afford the other yeah. therapeutic modalities yeah so uh, it's it's very good to set up a target but yes. uh, in indian condition if a poor patient is suffering from hypercholesterolemia and homozygous hypercholesterolemia it is extremely impossible to bring his ldl cholesterol down to 70 it's excellent to set up targets no no we fully agree with you we fully agree with you unless you set a target you will never try to achieve it it is always better to have goals in life and try to achieve it you might feel some short of it if you don't try with available medicines whatever you have at your disposal <coughs> you will come near some somewhere near about the target may be possible that you will not be able to reach the target but that is not to say that you should the target if there's no target is there then you won't treat the ndl cholesterol at all then you won't even add azetamide to your treatment yes so whatever is available must do it but is an effort of lai lai is already providing free drugs to such patients fh patients in the form of statin and azetamide because not ecs can i mean with us but this yes is, i think that yes. this with yes, sir with your permission can i just add something sir case has been projected as a case of probably a familial heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia 22 years old he had undergone cabg number 1 he started the patient only on atorvastatin 80 mg i think he should have chosen rosvastatin 40 mg which is considered to be more powerful when compared to atorvastatin 80 mg as far as the ldl cholesterol reduction is concerned but to number 3 i don't know why rosvastatin 40 mg with rosvastatin he was started initially with rosvastatin 40 mg he had uh, uh, complaints of myalgia subsequently we had tried with atorvastatin 80 mg and we found that he is tolerating he is uh, is quite thin so uh, we have to just uh, switch from yeah. one statin to other to find a better tolerance profile that's right i think you are perfectly just fine between those two drugs but uh, acetamide i don't know yeah. yes. acetamide has been given as 20 mg yeah. Is it is it possible? I just don't know about that. Is it about ten milligram? Only ten milligram, but he has given twenty milligram. I just don't don't That's know. That's okay. It. I mean, we don't have any experience, but twenty milligram can be tried if it is not causing any harm. <coughs> it might marginally reduce it further. 
I don't know if it will be. Yes. But it is not going to increase absorption. Increase the, yes. You know, it, it won't produce that <coughs> absorption more than that. So this uh, <coughs> patient, doctor, I think if you can afford bepedoic acid comes, you can add bepedoic acid. If you can afford PCS, yes, uh, through your government agencies or charitable organizations, you must try to get him. Approach the pharma companies which are bringing out this, approach them to procure some uh, uh, this one for this patient. I think it is advisable to go for a cascade screening in this city. Cascade screening. Yeah, that should be done. That should, that should be, be done. done. What is then you can identify who are going yeah. to get the problems. So I think that trans question being answered, not very satisfactorily for Dopic Deepak and us, but uh, Deepak, uh, keep this patient with you because after homozygous patients, we are going to have a trial on heterozygous patient also. In case uh, uh, we start that trial with heterozygous patient, then we can definitely enroll your patient because it has not, uh, you have not been able to achieve the target. So be yeah. in touch with us so that in case we start it, we'll be in, definitely uh, will communicate with you. Yes, How sir. Today, yeah. today itself, I'll be sending a mail at your mail ID that is lipid aoi at the rate of gmail dot com, so right, that, that uh, the patient can get the help. Okay, sure. Yes, sir, yes, please, sir. Sure. please enter the welcome. name name into the FH registry also, please. Please. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, sir. thank you. Thanks. Uh, how long the PCS can I to be continued in FH after the target levels are achieved? These, this is lifelong, you have to continue lifelong, unfortunately. But there is a possibility, these are all future possibilities, that you may be able to reduce the frequency of dosing, or if they achieve LDL target, if it is heterozygous, achieve the target, you may be able to stop and see, look at the follow-up, monitor the levels. There is a possibility what is called the legacy effect of these drugs, which maintain the effect of these drugs for longer time, even after to stop the drug, but no future possibilities. Otherwise, lifelong treatment is the treatment of choice. Uh, any other questions? How many aphoresis centers are active in India now? No, no center. Uh, any other questions? Dr. Deepak, we had some more questions, I thought. I think we can request the moderators and yeah, yeah. non-fasting lipid profiles will have highly variable TG levels depending on type of food. So should we give less importance to TG that value, Dr. Deeper? So I think Dr. Sat uh, they showed the clear in, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, guidelines, uh, recommendations. Uh, request all the speakers and moderators to uh, just start with themselves. And we can take an open forum for all the questions that are there. Yes. Dr. Dr. Rao, so, would you like to answer, Dr. Chabi? Would you like to answer about that? Dr. 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 Raut Ray? Dr. 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 Sir? Uh, um, Dr. Jayashree Shwai? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, would you like to answer that question? Hello. Yeah. Uh, Hello, mm -hmm. am I audible? Yes, uh, yes, madam. Uh, uh, that question, sir, for Dr. Deepak Das, uh, was uh, fasting versus non fasting triglyceride um, uh, labels. And uh, that uh, if non fasting triglyceride label can be more comfortable, convenient, and also it is safer for the diabetes. But uh, most of this day we are Indian or the other, most of the day we are in this post pandemic state. And the last few years, researchers, uh, researchers have been uh, looking at this beneficial effect of the non fasting versus the fastings. So, if, if in the non fasting, if your triglyceride level is more than 200 milligrams per deciliter, it is you are taking it as high. So, there is not much benefit fasting versus non fasting in the diabetes. Hello? Yes, yes. Dr. Shwain, it's audible. Yeah, yeah, there's a I think that answers well. Dr. Raman, you want to add something? 
I think uh, post-perennial uh, uh, triglyceride is an extremely important uh, uh, assessment. It should be done routinely in all the patients because that is what we have shown in the slide also that you should have a patient has fasting, we should have non-fasting also because uh, remnant cholesterol uh, is uh, more dangerous than anything else. Yeah. And what is uh, you see remnant cholesterol is uh, in post-perennial state. And uh, you should always remember that uh, calomicron remnants are you know, which are normally not uh, detected in fasting, they they have about 20 to 25 percent, uh, uh, you know, uh, percentage of uh, BLDL is because of chylomicron remnant, and that can cause more uh, severe coronary artery disease. Therefore, it has been found out that uh, postprandial hypertrichosidemia is associated with more cardiovascular event as compared to those who don't have. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Nirmal, please. One more question. Post-prandial hyperglycemia after how many hours? Uh, normally, uh, uh, it should be done up to uh, four hours uh, because whatever, uh, you know, the peak has to be achieved is achieved. And there are actually some limitation of uh, what we call as a, uh, it's a oral fat loading test, basically we call it. It is like DTT that you give a, you know, uh, a pre-specified uh, fat. More more commonly, it is 400 ml of milk with 75 gram of pastry is a normal, you know, fat which is given for this particular test. And uh, we should take samples for uh, lipid profile and sugar every two hours and up to four hours. Most of the time in the normal persons, it comes down by two to three hours time. So up to four hours is uh, good enough. There is no point in going up to eight hours. So I think I think it's really not well standardized so far, but it will get standardized shortly. The problem is the problem find, is that if you sir, find sir, problem you find is that the fat content. One one minute moment. If you find the triglycerides are high, then do a fasting triglycerides in the next. Uh, this is done only when you are uh, fasting. Uh, the fasting triglyceride is normal. Only then this test is done. Otherwise, if it is high, postprandial is high, then it is no. There is no justification in doing it. There is a very good study actually which was conducted in women, in children and in men and uh, more than one lakh for each test. And then I think uh, these people had identified in the postprandial state the triglyceride levels go up by 26%. Non-HDL goes by about 6%. The rest of the things don't change at all. In fact, the LDL cholesterol comes down by 8 milligrams. That is the data that has been published based on the huge information what is available today. So the postprandial triglycerides, if it is crossing 200 milligrams, you need to concentrate on the fasting triglyceride levels. If the fasting triglyceride levels is also on the higher side, then you need to think about medications which can be used for an individual who has got an atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk, higher risk. The other question is, uh, uh, do this increase uh, triglyceride? Do you want uh, to take up in the, from the chat box? Yeah. Dr. Vishwaranjan want to yeah, yeah. say something? This yes. increase the triglyceride risk is also applicable to non-diabetic or it is only in diabetic? No, non-diabetic also. Equally? Uh, risk yes. Non-diabetic and diabetic. Yes. Before you start treating this patient with hypertriglyceride, you need to rule out all secondary causes. Very important including hypothyroidism, chronic kidney disease, high carbohydrate intake, chronic alcoholism, or alcohol binging in the previous nights. Those may come without revealing this fact. Then you will encounter a problem of high triglyceride levels. You need to be very careful. It is very variable. The triglyceride reports in laboratories are very variable. So in, uh, do you require repeated yeah. study or on a single report will also cut treatment? Uh, yeah. One question is, can non-HDL cholesterol be a more appropriate target in Indians versus LDL? LDL? Non-HDL cholesterol, I think uh, all of you are aware about this uh, estimation, not the laboratory method, is only a calculation. Total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol gives you the number and that is non-HDL cholesterol. Non-HDL cholesterol has got an advantage in the sense it includes your so-called culprit LDL cholesterol, IDL, PLDL, 
PLDL remnants, hylomicron, hylomicron remnants, and hypoprotein little a. So everything on, actually comes under this label of non HDL cholesterol. Estimating the non HDL cholesterol and then taking it as a target is not being propagated at present. The Lipid Association of India clearly tells you that it should be considered as a pro primary target. The moment you reach your LDL goal, then you look at the non HDL cholesterol, which is almost equal to the estimation of APOP. APOP, you require a good standardization. Then you need to think about the small particles, LDL particles, which are actually covered by this APOP. Instead of asking for an APOP, which is not well standardized in various laboratories, if you depend only on a simple calculation, which does not require your biochemist support, I think that is reasonable. The recent data which was published with regard to your PCSK9 or any of the recent studies, they try to concentrate on non material cholesterol all the time. What is happening to this level of non material apart from the LDL cholesterol? So time is not far off to witness the non material cholesterol becoming a co-primary target at present may become a primary target. Uh, next question is, uh, yeah, any other question? I think all questions were covered. Any, any, yeah. I mean, speakers, moderators would like to make a comment? Uh, Do the LAI guidelines for any evidence in India? Yeah. Is the LAI speak guidelines... loudly? Louder, louder, please. Uh, do the do the LAI guidelines for Indians is based on any evidence in Indian population? You are is with, there any evidence? Yeah, you are aware that India doesn't have any outcomes data so far. So what we have done is we have epidemiological studies which we have taken into consideration, and you have an inter-heart study which has included Indians who had MI twenty six thousand patients compared with twenty six thousand patients who didn't have MI. So that is one data, but outcome data we don't have. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Starting PCS K9, Azitimide. Right. So it's all of us who bring up the uh, these studies in future. Then that's for the expert opinion. But as far as the risk is concerned, there's no difference between any other country and India. There may be little differences, subtle differences. So we have taken those subtle differences into account to uh, recommend various sort of treatments. Raman and uh, would like to add? That's right. See, if, uh, we, uh, because of that only we have come out with a consensus expert. Otherwise, we would have come out with the guidelines. For guidelines, we require randomized control trials. We don't have our randomized control trials so far. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think all questions are completed. Dr. If Dr. Panda, if you... Yes, Dr. Panda, I want please. to ask one question. One question. Yes, madam. Shabhi, madam. Can the patient's treatment for evolutimab can be given free if it is registered? <laughs> well, in the trial, yes. If we, if we, I mean, if you've got a HOFH patient and you enter the trial, probably there you will be able to get the free treatment during the period of trial. That's the trial which uh, LA is going to start shortly. But other cases, only free treatment, only statin and azitimide. Yeah. That, and, will, yeah, that will be given lifelong. Very difficult to get a welcome free of cost because even I have patients with their whole family life. I am not able to give them free. And the next question: How much is the genetic testing costing, and can the sample be sent from one place to other? Mm. The answer is yes. Uh, if we, if you go through LAI, it will cost you uh, five thousand plus courier charge, charges here, and. Uh, uh, that is uh, otherwise in other hospital these tests cost about uh, 20000 plus so it is almost 25% of uh, the charges which other hospital takes you okay thank you so one more question of uh, dr gopinath parida mm -hmm. any incidence of the new onset of dm during the use of pcsk9 and agitamide no is only with statins, not with PCSK9 and Desitimide. 
So, uh, P- PCS K9 are known to have cardiotoxicity like trastuzumab, uh, we know. So, is there any fear of uh, cardiotoxicity uh, in monoclonal antibodies, uh, what you use for uh, reducing LDL? PCS K9 is no. No. I mean, uh, not in nilirocumab studies, they are very safe. I mean, though we have the follow-up of, I think, two and a half to three years now. Okay. Osler is five years now. Osler is five years. Ah, randomized years. Yeah. And except for the local site re- in reaction. Get to site reaction. Yeah. yeah. No other side effects. Right. With the tail as low as seven milligram, less than 10 milligram in many patients. So very, very interactive session. <laughs> on of queries. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Panda for giving the closing remarks and the vote of thanks to the uh, live moderators and speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a very long session and uh, it's much beyond our plan because of the initial uh, hiccups uh, in, in net system. It took little long, but still people are there with us. I appreciate that half of the audience are still with us and uh, we had almost uh, 100 people who are uh, very important for us uh, in the field because they are the people who see the metabolic medicine. Most of them I know personally. And uh, this is a very good time. This evening is utilized. I thank uh, the leader, uh, Dr. Raman Puri, uh, who has been working uh, for the last uh, almost two decades in the field of lipids and guided the whole country and uh, in this part of the world in the lipid management. So you can uh, tell him as the father of lipidology in India and under his uh, leadership, uh, all his army are working. And uh, first of all, I give a big applaud on behalf of uh, the doctors of the Odisha uh, to the leader who has uh, started new avenues in this field, uh, Dr. Raman Puri. Salute to the uh, leader. Then, <laughs> that's, uh, that's too much. That's too much. The fund is so nice of you. I don't no, deserve sir. that. I don't deserve that. Yeah, yeah, the we team, all... uh, Dr. Ayengar is there, Dr. Narsingan is there. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is there. So it's a team which works. You know. Dr. Ayengar Ayengar has to be there. Narsingan, we have heard him in many forums. And today also they have given their expert view uh, in uh, diabetic dyslipidemia as well as familial uh, hypercholesterolemia very nicely and they have taken up the questions so nice. So we had a lot of questions covering every field, starting from LDL to diabetes to familial hypercholesterolemia and the and many were related to guideline formulated by the LAI and I think almost all aspects including the newer drugs, newer intervention are covered. Many many questions were from our panel itself and Dr. Deepak uh, who is a faculty in the cardiology has asked many vital issues which are questions for many, not his own, but questions for many. And they, are, they have answered very well. So I thank Dr. Ayangar and, and Dr. Narsingan also for their time. They have spared the whole evening first. And out of our panel, uh, Professor S.N. Rautrai, a much demanded cardiologist, has spent the evening. He has stayed with us and uh, shared his views. I thank uh, Professor Rautrai for his time, my uh, co-chairman, and uh, all our moderators. Dr. Uh, B. R. Mishra, Dr. R. N. Kaur, uh, Dr. Gopinath Parida, they are all uh, senior cardiologists and physicians and they are into field. They have uh, moderated the session and they were there. All of them are here till end. And our speakers are VG cardiologists, diabetologists and lipidologists, uh, Dr. Uh, Jayashri Shwai, Dr. Uh, Nirmal Mohanty, Dr. Shabi Shatpathi. They have shared their wisdom and uh, I beg a pardon on behalf of the organizing committee because there are some technical hitches and uh, there may be some audio, some uh, video disturbances in between, but I, of late this was corrected and this is unavoidable in a digital um, platform. Uh, all of you have experienced that. Then I thank all our uh, delegates who are uh, very uh, senior physicians and the uh, practic- practicing metabolic uh, physicians who have spent their time, uh, quality time in learning lipidology. And uh, I thank uh, Torrent Pharmaceuticals uh, for hosting this whole event, the partner of our uh, Lipid Association of India in this uh, Lipid uh, lipid uh, Academic Interface 
where uh, many important issues are taken up hardly we get a session completely dedicated to lipids and uh, lipid association of india specifically taken up this for state of odisha i wish more people should have participated but uh, because of this situation because of the, um, the, <laughs> the odisha is having many challenges at this point of time i understand many are engaged in their uh, personal issues and also the professional front but those who have learned uh, they will be benefited i'm sure and the message will go to everyone and the uh, recording of the uh, whole discussion and the powerpoints can also be of use for the rest if uh, torrent phal pharma takes the lead of uh, circulating a, a summary of the uh, session amongst the uh, physicians cardiologists diabetologists and also the people who are concerned for the metabolic medicine that will be used for uh, useful for everyone so i thank everyone all the delegates uh, the host the uh, leaders from lipid association the patrons uh, dr puri dr ayangar and mersingan and my co chairman and all the uh, panelists uh, our moderators as well as speakers and uh, hope uh, it was a very useful evening we have learned a lot uh, from all three presentations and will uh, like to have more sessions in the future maybe on uh, different issues related to the uh, metabolic front and dyslipidemia i'm sure uh, dr puri will be uh, kind enough to take up and uh, not forget odisha because he has the responsibility of covering each and every state around and in the turn we come uh, again after 30 states but uh, still we expect uh, more uh, attention for this state because though we have many issues because you have seen the internet has disturbed today uh, many part of the odisha is not very uniformly connected but people are uh, very keen in discussing and the interest is more the interaction is more so thank you thank you everyone and wish to uh, see you all again and good night thank, thank you sir thank you panda sir my special thanks to raut ray sir and uh, panda sir today more than 60 delegate participated in the program and a special thanks to all moderator speakers and i thank you very much good night thank you, thank you so much thank you so much good night, night.